Part 2. Thank. You. Demiurge. Once his master left, the first thing Kozaitis did was express his gratitude to Demiurge. Demiurge responded to the deeply bowed Kozaitis with the same serene smile as always. No, there's no need for thanks. How could that be without your help? The lizard men would have been exterminated. Cositus, I believe the reason why Ain Sama approved of your suggestion was because Ain Sama had foreseen such a development. As Demiurge delivered his summation with an appraised finger, a startled gasp rang through the air. The sound seemed to have come from himself, or the guardians around him. In other words, I believe Ain Sama anticipated that you would say such a thing. That was why he sent you to the Lizardman village. I felt that was the case because Ain Sama seemed most delighted to hear you oppose the destruction of the Lizardmen village. In contrast, he sounded quite disappointed when you could not bring up an alternative solution. You mean to say Ain Sama was disappointed because things did not go according to plan precisely. In other words, even the conversation we are having now might well have been foreseen by Ain Sama. As expected of Ain Sama, he has planned everything out with meticulous perfection. Be but a uh, spit it out or obeyed her little brother mare to speak, in a stern tone of voice. Ah, why yes, eh? I was wondering why he had sent out such weak undead at first. Eh, eh? But perhaps, Ain Sama had planned on the attack failing from the start. Well, rather than say that he had planned to be defeated, isn't it more like our master had anticipated that Kozaitis would have investigated the lizard men's strength and then mentioned that victory might be in doubt? A profound sense of shame fell over Kozaitis as he remembered his exchange with Demiurge back then. After all, he had messed everything up. He couldn't have come up with something like that if he didn't understand Kozaitis so well. Well, that's Ain Sama for you. While we have already seen Ain Sama's outstanding warrior prowess during the battle with Shaltir, to think he also possessed such extraordinary talent as a schemer, I could not help but prostrate myself before him in awe. While Ain Sama may have said otherwise, I feel that nothing can go wrong if we simply obey Ain Sama's orders. He's really amazing. He truly lives up to the name of the one who united all the supreme beings. Shaltir excitedly added her own praise after Demiurges. The other guardians nodded in agreement. After returning to his room, Ains jumped onto his bed. He hung briefly in the air before his body sank into the bed and then he started to roll. He rolled right, and then he rolled left. The bed was big enough for him to do so. His luxurious robe was crumpled from this but Haynes paid it no heed, giggling quietly as he rolled around. The reason Haynes was doing such a childish thing was because there was nobody in this room besides him. Soon, Haynes had indulged his childish desire for the soft sheets. He then lay on his back, facing the ceiling. Ah, I'm so tired. Eh, I want to loosen up and get drunk. Although I can't do that now. After complaint to the air, he sighed deeply, although Ains could not breathe, so he was just going through the motions. Ains was undead, so physical and mental exhaustion were foreign to him. However, in human terms, he had spent every day hard at work for the past month. If he had a stomach, it would be in ruins by now. Ains was currently filled with stress. The warrior Morn had defeated the silver-haired vampire Shaltir. Perhaps someone who was not in full possession of the facts might think it was simply impressive. But to the mysterious person who had used a world-class item on Shaltir, it would mean something else. 
the opposition might have their eye on Ains, or they might try to make contact with him. Therefore, Ains spent his days on high alert, with many cash items ready so he could make his escape at any time. During his free time, he indulged in a little bit of mental role-play or exercising his imagination. More like and studied whether he would be able to escape if the enemy came for him, while at the same time gathering information about his foe. This nerve-wracking daily life had little effect on Ains Ulgaon, but it tired out the remnants of his humanity of Suzuki Satoru's personality. The reason why he indulged in immature behavior when he was alone and had free time was probably a sign that Suzuki Satoru was under a lot of stress, hidden beneath the facade of Ains. I don't remember ever working without rest or sleep like this. I wonder how much overtime I'll get this month. Perhaps that griping had come from the personality of Suzuki Satoru overriding that of Ains's. The Great Underground Tomb of Nazarick. No, Ains Ulgaon isn't a stock corporation. As a joint venture company, we're supposed to be a moral enterprise, so we ought to pay all employees the overtime they're due. After wing to himself like that, Ains furrowed his non-existent eyebrows. Hmm. Don't tell me I'm not entitled to overtime because I have a post allowance. Ua. Ains rolled around again, and then froze after about half a dozen iterations. All right. That's enough useless thinking for one day. That said, I'm really impressed that Kozitis actually said something like that. It had come as quite a surprise to think Kositis actually felt sympathy for the lizard men. In truth, Kositis's actions had been a big headache for Ains. Suzuki Satoru was the sort of person who would thoroughly research his sources and regurgitate them by rote when called upon to deliver a briefing. Therefore, he was not used to dealing with unexpected things. However, as long as it was written down in his notes, he could use them to deal with it. In other words, the success of Suzuki Satoru's briefings rested on how much research he did and how well he could use it to respond to the circumstances. He was extremely inept in dealing with situations which required adaptability. In fact, he hated them. He could not bring his notes into the throne room and say, Ah, please look at the next page. Therefore, Ains had mentally rehearsed the events in the throne room over ten times beforehand. As he did, he prayed that nobody would do anything surprising. And then, Kositis had shattered that tiny wish of his. He had been extremely worried about what Kositis would say, but he was also very happy. That was the joy a parent might have as though a hitherto docile and obedient child had expressed his own opinion for once. The important thing was that Kositis's growth had far exceed Ains's expectations. When Ains had returned to Nazarick earlier, he had asked one of the maids to cook something a steak. Perhaps she might need practice when it came to the Donis and other major points of the meal, but Ains did not have such high expectations of the steak. Neither did he want food which granted bonuses, like food in YGGDRASIL. All he wanted was something edible. However, the result could only be described as a lump of charcoal. No matter how often that maid practiced, she could only make chunks of charred meat. Ains had accepted that outcome as he accepted the maid's heartfelt apologies. After all, it was the same as him trying to equip the great sword in his wardrobe. In YGGDRASIL, one needs specialized skills to make food. It was only to be expected, since food and drink could grant special bonuses when consumed. However, that may did not possess such skills. In other words, if one lacked the proper skills to perform a task, it would end in failure. The matter of Kositis was also an experiment of sorts. Ains wanted to see if finalized characters like himself and the NPCs could learn anything new. 
This experiment was designed to see if they could grow strong by learning tactics and strategy. He had given Kozitas command over the weak undead because he felt that he would be able to learn more from their defeat. In the end, Ains had been pleased with the results. Kozitas had shown Ains that he had the possibility for growth. Of course, there was a huge difference between theory and practice. Ains's upcoming objective was to thoroughly master the details of this world's unique magic if such magic existed. Currently, Ains was still unclear whether magic was a skill or knowledge. However, this experiment showed that one's knowledge could still grow. Kozitas had proved the possibility of that development. He had done very well. Ains thought. A lack of growth was equivalent to stagnation. Even if he was powerful now, he might be surpassed one day. Even if he had a hundred years advantage in military technology, he would still lose his pole position if he did not continue improving himself. There might be a strong nation nearby, but they would be utter fools if they assumed that they would always be a strong nation and did not seek improvement. Well, I think that. But while I'm happy that the kids have grown, I'm also worried if I am a ruler who's worthy of their loyalty. Ains looked at the veiling as he muttered this. Ah, it's so scary, I'm so scared. The remnants of Suzuki Satoru's personality wailed in fear of the unknown. Growth was change. Then, who could guarantee that their absolute loyalty would not change? Even if it did not, he was still afraid that someday they would consider him unworthy of being the ruler of the glorious Nazarick. He feared being forced out of his position as guildmaster. I have to become a leader that the guardians will want to follow. Why isn't there anyone to teach me the path of rulership? There was probably nobody in Nazarick who was designed for such a purpose. As Ains fell into contemplation, he thought of two people, from the five worsts of Nazarick. One of them was Kyuhuku, who bore the title of Duke, and the other was Gashiku Kotuo, who had the title of King. Ains wondered if he could ask them to teach him, and his answer was simple and succinct. Hell no. He did not want to learn from them unless he had no other choice. Forget it. As long as I don't mess up too much, I won't need to retire. Also, yes, about those two-legged sheep. Ains had already surmised the true identity of the two-legged sheep which was why he had not asked about their appearance. They were monsters he had seen in YGGDRASIL before. They have the heads of a lion and a goat, and a serpentine tail. Their hands are those of lions and their feet are those of goats. They are chimerae. In YGGDRASIL, chimerae walked on two legs, attacking with lion's paws, which served as arms. Each of them had two heads, one of a lion and one of a goat. That was because these monsters were based on the visual data of monsters known as Baphomets. So why had Demiurge not come out and said that they were chimerae? Ains had his doubts, but then he also had an answer. In other words, the mutant chimerae. Am I right, Demiurge? Ains chuckled, and then he added a mental note to his opinion of Demiurge. He had terrible naming sense. Well, the chimera lords in YGGDRASIL looked kind of no, fish like chimera look disgusting. So these two-legged sheep are a new breed of chimera. That makes them holy kingdom, chimera. It might be good to bring one of them to Nazarick. And then there's Victim. Hmm. Victim looked just like how Ains remembered, but one thing stood out in his mind. The language he's using. Is that Enochian, the language of angels? It feels like he's saying something else entirely. It was translated, Sanains did not know what sort of language he was using, but it felt weird to him. Of course, that might be because Ains did not know Enochian at all. Forget it, let's not worry about it. All right, it's about time to set out. Ains rolled around again. 
He stopped when he was face down, to verify something that had been bothering him since just now. He pressed his face to the bed, and sniffed. Ains had no lungs, so he was merely going through the motions. Strangely enough, he could smell something. This is the smell of flowers. Did someone spray perfume on this bed? Are the beds of the wealthy like this? That's pretty surprising. Maybe I should keep them in mind when I'm pretending to be wealthy, then. Umu.